Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the Mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Today's uh, topic, uh, which is a continuation of what we did yesterday about uh, the process of breathing. Uh, today we shall uh, go a little further and uh, focus more on the regulation of breathing. Uh, as in the case of the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, which is closely linked to it, also is uh, delicately regulated by a large uh, number of uh, reflexes originating at many places in the body. But uh, all the same, it runs on its own. However, respiration is unique in being a function which is uh, both uh, autonomic, that is, it runs on its own. We don't have to remember to breathe, just as we don't have to remember to beat our heart. But at the same time, as and when we like, we can control it voluntarily. We can control the rate and the pattern of breathing voluntarily, at least up to a point. Why up to a point? Because uh, uh, we can't hold our breath beyond a certain point and we can't uh, go on breathing very fast and hard beyond a point. And why that is so, we shall see today. So, But all the same, we know that we can alter the rate and pattern of breathing as and when we like. And that is what uh, many of the breathing practices of yoga are about. So with that little introduction, uh, let me go to slide sharing. The YES courses and the other uh, activities of the YES project are a part of the 150th birth anniversary of Shorobindo and the 75th year of India's independence. Before we go to the regulation of breathing, let's talk for a while about uh, the breathing reserve. What type of a reserve we have uh, when it comes to the respiratory system? Uh, normally, uh, we saw yesterday that we breathe about 500 milliliters of air each time we breathe in and out. But uh, if a person is asked to breathe as fast and as hard as possible, then we can achieve a maximum voluntary ventilation of about 100 liters per minute. Now, this cannot be arrived at by just measuring the vital capacity and then multiplying it by the maximum rate at which we can breathe. Because if we breathe as much as we do in the vital capacity, we'll not be able to breathe very fast. It's something like, you know, walking, as we saw in the case of the heart, uh, if we take very big steps, uh, then uh, we can't take the steps very frequently. On the other hand, if we try to take the steps as frequently as possible, then the steps can't be very big. So to achieve the maximum output, uh, we strike a compromise. And that is what happens here in breathing also. If you ask a person to breathe as fast and as hard as he can, then he breathes uh, faster than normal and also harder than normal, but not the fastest possible and also not as much as in the measurement of vital capacity. So by working out the right type of combination, the person is able to achieve a maximum voluntary ventilation of about 100 liters per minute. Uh, those who are athletes or uh, uh, take very regular physical activity, may be able to achieve much more. But uh, normally at rest, we take in and take out only 500 milliliters of air. And let's say, assume for simplicity that the respiratory rate is 14 per minute so that we get a minute volume. That is the ventilation per minute, what we call pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation in this case can also be called the minute volume of 7 liters per minute. So the maximum possible is 100 and uh, the uh, what we actually use at rest is only 7, which means that 93 liters of ventilation we are holding in reserve. And uh, that gives us a sort of a breathing reserve ratio of 93%. When this ratio falls below 60%, the person starts finding it hard to breathe. Technically, we call it dyspnea which is difficulty in breathing. And uh, therefore, uh, this difficulty in breathing comes much before uh, much of the reserve has been encroached upon. And still there is a reserve left, but the person is finding it difficult to breathe. And this may be treated as a sort of a warning sign that something should be done. We don't uh, remain symptom-free till we reach the very last, uh, till we are encroached upon the entire reserve. So you can say there's a reserve within the reserve 
we get a warning much before the reserve has really been exhausted. Now, there is another type of reserve. We saw yesterday that the gas exchange actually takes place in the alveoli, the air sacs, which are at the end of the smallest airways, the alveolar ducts, and uh, the pulmonary capillary comes in close contact with each of these uh, air sacs. And uh, uh, you can see that the pulmonary uh, capillary, a certain length of the pulmonary capillary is very close to the air sac. And uh, within this, the maxim, the, all the exchange that had to take place, that is picking up uh, oxygen and giving up carbon dioxide to the air sacs, takes place in the first one third of this capillary, which means that there is a lot of reserve here also. We have this much length of the capillary available, but it is in the first one third that the exchange takes place. And that's why you know, I have just drawn these blue dots only up to this place and then shifted it to red. So within the one th first one third, the exchange has all taken place. Now you can easily understand at least one situation in which this reserve comes in handy. The duration, uh, how much length, uh, in how much length the exchange will take place will de depend upon how fast the blood is flowing. And how fast the blood is flowing will depend upon the heart rate because it is eventually coming from the heart. Now in exercise, the heart rate goes up and we have seen that uh, and the resting heart rate may be only 80 or and the uh, maximum heart rate during exercise, maximum useful heart rate is 180. So if it increases from 80 to 180, the duration for which the blood stays in this capillary becomes naturally much less because the blood is moving faster. But then because normally at rest, it takes only one third of the capillary. When the heart rate increases in the flow becomes fast, it may take 70 or 80 percent of the length of the capillary which means that all the exchange that has to take place can still take place in spite of that increased heart rate and therefore faster flow throughs through the capillary. So this is another type of reserve at the micro level, as you can see, which is also built in. And some of these things will become relevant also when we talk about some of the claims or rather assertions which yoga teachers are very fond of making. When you breathe fast, you take in more oxygen and your body gets more oxygen and that goes to the cells. If your cells get more oxygen, then uh, you get more healthy and so on and so forth. So how much truth there is in all that we'll see and how much it is really needed. Uh, because with all this reserve, uh, doing that extra bit, you can see really uh, cannot do much good. But then you will come to that a little later. Now we'll concentrate on the gas transport itself. Oxygen and carbon dioxide transport. The oxygen and carbon dioxide transport or transfer from the alveoli to the blood or blood to the alveoli uh, takes place uh, in these air sacs. And uh, there is a total of about 600 million of these. And this total surface area is about 100 square meters, which is the area of a tennis court. Gases flow from a high pressure area to a low pressure area that we saw. Uh, when we were talking about the mechanics of breathing also. Now that same thing applies also to each gas separately, which means that uh, in the pressure of oxygen uh, in the alveoli and in the capillary will determine which way the oxygen will move. And in the same way, the pressure of oxygen or carbon dioxide in the alveoli and in the capillaries will determine which way the carbon dioxide will move. Now, in case of gases, the pressure depends on the concentration. Concentration means how much is packed in how much space. That is what concentration is. And why these gases behave independently that we can understand. It's not that the total pressure exerted by all the gases put together will determine which way individual gases move. Now, let's try to understand this. Um, uh, suppose you have uh, two areas. In this case, it's the alveoli and the capillaries. But say you can even imagine two uh, uh, cylinders or two glasses or two cups which are separated by a partition. In one of them, uh, the cups are of the same size, but in one of them, you have uh, 100 molecules of the gas. In the other one, you have 10. So if you have 100, the concentration is much more. The way, place where you have 10, uh, the concentration is much less. And therefore, the pressure exerted by the gas where there are 100 molecules is more, and that exerted in those where there are 10, that is less. Now, why this pressure is more or less depending upon the concentration? That is because these molecules are not at rest. They are having random movements this way and that. Huh? 
they are moving all the time. So if you have 100 molecules moving at random and striking against the walls of the container and so on, the pressure naturally will be more. If you have only 10 molecules doing that within the same space, this pressure exerted uh, and the way they will strike against the walls will be much less frequent. Now you remove the partition between the two and uh, let the two communicate. Now, as a result of this random motion, what will happen is the molecules can also migrate from one of these cups to the other cup. They can move from one to the other. Now, because the random movement of 100 molecules here uh, will ensure that uh, a lot of molecules will get transferred to the other cup, whereas only 10 here vibrating like that means fewer will migrate there, which means on the whole, the flow will be from the side on which there are 100 as compared to those where there are 10. And after some time, they'll equalize and the result will be you'll achieve some sort of a, a, a intermediate concentration and intermediate pressure at both places. Okay. So now this will not be affected by another gas. Suppose there are instead of one gas, two gases present. The Suppose oxygen 100 on this side and 10 on this side. Carbon dioxide 10 on this side and 100 on this side. Now, the random movement of these is independent. So, if oxygen is more on this side and less on this side, it will move this way. If carbon dioxide is more on this side, then this random movement would mean that it more will go to the other side. So, they will behave independently. So, pressure depends on the concentration and the movement, which we call diffusion in this case, will depend upon the individual concentrations of the gases. And uh, that's how oxygen and carbon dioxide can behave differently. They can move in different directions. Uh, here you can see that uh, the oxygen transport. Uh, oxygen uh, is being transferred from uh, the alveolus, the air sac, to the capillary because of the pressure difference. In the alveoli, it's about 100. Here it is only about 40 millimeters of mercury. So there's 60 millimeter pressure difference. And that's how the oxygen moves this way. And uh, after entering here, uh, initially it would dissolve in the fluid, but then from there it's picked up by the hemoglobin in the red cells. And therefore, a lot more can be picked up than would just dissolve. And, uh, and that's how we are able to carry a large amount of oxygen uh, because it combines with hemoglobin. And uh, what contributes to the pressure is what is dissolved. And therefore, it will keep flowing till. The pressure has been equalized, but in the meantime, quite a bit has been picked up by the uh, hemoglobin in the red cells. And uh, the point at which in the capillary, when this equilibrium is reached, that is the pressure becomes 100 on both sides. And here it doesn't fall because you are breathing continuously. So here uh, it remains more or less constant at 100. And here from 40 to 100 will be achieved in the first one third of the capillary, as we saw. And uh, then the degree of saturation of hemoglobin uh, will be almost 100%. So it's about 100% saturated at 100 millimeters of mercury. So this 100 millimeters of mercury pressure, which will be achieved in the pulmonary capillary because of reaching an equilibrium with the air sacs, will give us a 100% concentration, saturation of hemoglobin. But uh, the hemoglobin is saturated to the extent of 90%, even when the pressure is only 60. Now, how will the pressure be 60? One way would be in good health if you migrate to a high altitude or you're flying where the air pressure is low. If the air pressure is low, the uh, oxygen pressure will also fall. And uh, if the pressure here falls to 60, as may happen, say, at an altitude of, uh, uh, say, 15,000 feet or 16,000 feet or something, uh, if uh, the pressure falls to 60, then here also the pressure achieved will be 60. You can't exceed that. It will be an equilibrium. But even at 60 millimeters, the hemoglobin will be saturated to the extent of 90%. Now, you can see once again, there is a reserve built in uh, because uh, the fall in the oxygen pressure up to as low as 60 millimeters is still giving us 90% saturation of the hemoglobin, which means the person will still have, be, will be still carrying uh, almost the same amount of oxygen as at sea level uh, when the pressure in the air sacs is 100. What will be the another situation in which only 60 may be achieved here? If there's a disease. If there's a disease because of which not enough diffusion of oxygen can take place, there's some sort of a barrier, the lungs are congested or uh, these membranes are thickened or whatever. 
or the alveoli are damaged. Because of that, suppose the equilibrium cannot be reached and the pressure here may be 100. We are at sea level. But the pressure achieved in the capillary is only 60. Even if you are able to achieve a pressure of 60 there, still hemoglobin will be 90% saturated. And then this is eventually being carried to the heart and from heart, the left ventricle is pumping it to the whole body. And that, that network of arteries is once again breaking into capillaries. And these capillaries are bringing this blood with oxygen pressure at 100 and hemoglobin fully saturated with oxygen in close contact with the cells. And it is here that the transfer takes place. In the cells, the oxygen tension uh, can be different at different places and the estimates are not uh, very reliable. But say, suppose it's 20 millimeters of mercury and here it is 100. So oxygen will flow from the capillary into the cells and uh, the cells will extract as much oxygen as they need. Not more, not less. Uh, they just extract as much as they need. This is obvious from the fact that when the blood flows out, it is not free from oxygen. It still has a lot of oxygen. If we take, say, the mixed venous blood, that is, the blood has returned from different parts of the body after giving up the oxygen that was required. When this blood reaches uh, the when this blood reaches the uh, right ventricle, oh, sorry, right atrium, that is the venous blood which is uh, returning after giving up its oxygen to all parts of the body, that mixed venous blood, that still has quite a bit of oxygen. Say if we talk in terms of figures, the blood that comes to the uh, cells in the, from the left ventricle, from the arteries, has 20 milliliters of oxygen in each 100 milliliters. The blood that flows out the mixed venous blood has 15. So out of 20, only 5 milliliters have been extracted, which comes to how much? One fourth. One fourth is 20 percent, 25 percent. So 25 percent of uh, the oxygen has been extracted. 75 percent is still there in the venous blood, which is returning to the right heart, to the right atrium, and then coming to the lungs. So when the blood comes to the lungs, it is not free from oxygen. It's still carrying 75% of the oxygen, which it will have after oxygenation. Which means that the cells are not greedy. They are not trying to extract just because it is, happens to be available. Hmm? They take only as much this is required in different parts of the body. Now, let's take up this question. Uh, recently, you know, during the COVID crisis, we are all... Uh, uh, talking about the oxygen saturation. Now, when we're talking about how saturated the hemoglobin is with the oxygen, uh, we were talking of the percentage saturation, which we were talking about just now, that even at 60 millimeters, it's 90% saturated. Now, if you have the oxygen tension on this side and the hemoglobin saturation on this side, you find that the curve is somewhat like this. This is called a sigmoid curve, which means initially uh, there is uh, less increase in saturation for each millimeter mercury, then there's a steep increase, and then again there's a flattening. And that's why, you know, at 100, you have 100% saturation. At 90 millimeters of mercury, also it is almost 100%. And by the time you reach 60, it is still 90%. Now, but we were saying that uh, uh, the person should be hospitalized when the saturation is 93%. Why? Because uh, 90% at 60 millimeters of mercury means that firstly, the oxygen tension has already fallen quite low. And secondly, if as a result of the damage in the lungs because of the COVID infection, if there's a further damage, the tension would fall further. And when the tension falls further, then we may reach this point of the curve where it is steep, which means then the saturation will fall very steeply and that would indicate a further uh, fall in the oxygen tension here. So it is because, and then oxygen will not be available to the cells because we'll reach this steep part of the curve. So it will come down like this. And therefore, it's better to catch it in this zone. And you can catch it in this zone uh, only if you uh, catch it when it is uh, around 90%, because by then it has already fallen to 60 millimeters of mercury. And uh, to be on the safe side, why not 93%? So that's why 100% or nearly 100%, 97%, 98% is excellent. That is normal. Well, you can let it slide to 95, 94, 93, but then the moment it goes to 93, you fear that further damage 
may take it to 90, which would mean only 60 millimeters of mercury here, which means considerable damage in the lungs. And therefore, uh, before it goes to this steep decline, better to start giving oxygen from outside. If you give oxygen from outside, then the pressure is not 100. Then you are raising it artificially to 300, 400, whatever. So that's what oxygen from outside is doing. And when it does that, then in spite of the damage, the saturation will remain high. Now we come to a few other questions. Why is it dangerous to start the car while the garage is still closed? So, you know, in countries, uh, particularly where it is extremely cold outside, temperature outside may be freezing, uh, a person may enter the garage and then with the garage closed, because you can enter the garage even from inside the house. You feel that, well, let me start the car, let heat the car and then go out in the cold. If a person tries to do that, then sometimes the person may die. And that is because the exhaust from the car uh, releases carbon monoxide. And, the, and carbon monoxide also has a great affinity for oxygen. Sorry, for hemoglobin. So just as oxygen combines with hemoglobin, carbon monoxide also combines with hemoglobin, but with a much greater avidity. So carbon, carbon monoxide combines with hemoglobin with much greater efficiency than oxygen. And uh, here is the difference you can see. Uh, here this is uh, the partial pressure of oxygen and uh, this is the curve that we just saw. This is how the, you get more and more hemoglobin more and more saturated with oxygen as the pressure increases. By 100 millimeters, it's 100% saturated and even at 60, it is about 90% saturated and so on. So this was the curve you just saw. Now compare this with the carbon monoxide curve. So if instead of the oxygen pressure, this is the carbon monoxide pressure, then you find that hardly uh, not even 5 millimeters uh, pressure, the hemoglobin is 100% saturated with carbon monoxide. And it's not uh, carbon monoxide that our cells need, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide is a poison. And uh, therefore, all the, if all the hemoglobin gets occupied with uh, carbon monoxide, uh, because of the competition, oxygen uh, gets displaced and uh, all the hemoglobin gets uh, saturated with carbon monoxide, naturally the person uh, will die because of absence of oxygen. So that's why it is uh, uh, dangerous to start the car in a closed garage. It's also dangerous to sleep in a closed room with the fireplace on, you know, uh, with the coal smoldering. Uh, that also releases carbon monoxide. And that again, sometimes people may do when they use that type of uh, heating device, they might do that. Uh, in winters, the room is completely closed from all sides and uh, the fire is smoldering, which keeps the room warm. But then along with that, the coal is also, the burning coal is also releasing carbon monoxide and uh, that can also kill a person. Smoking. Now, this is something that pe some people do deliberately. And when they smoke, again, the cigarette smoke has a high concentration of carbon monoxide. So they are deliberately uh, sacrificing part of their hemoglobin. They may have a good hemoglobin level of 15 grams per 100 ml, but uh, they may actually give up uh, 10 out of that to the carbon monoxide and be left with only 5 uh, grams of hemoglobin, uh, which is uh, carrying oxygen. And uh, the result is, in spite of not having anemia, they feel the effect of anemia, get breathless on the lit in a little bit of exertion. So smoking, again, is doing the same thing. And uh, the same thing similar can happen because of atmospheric pollution. And the vehicle exhausts relaying carbon monoxide. And uh, when we breathe that, that again is doing the same thing, uh, uh, making us breathe a gas which competes uh, very effectively with uh, oxygen for binding with hemoglobin. And uh, that's how uh, our breathing can become hard and uh, the oxygen supply become deficient in the presence of carbon monoxide. Now, carbon dioxide transport. Here we find that uh, the movement is in the opposite direction. The blood that comes from uh, the different cells of the body in the venous blood that has 46 mil the pressure carbon dioxide pressure is 46 millimeters of mercury in the air sacs it's about 40 so you can see here the difference is much less there we had 100 compared to 40 here it is 46 compared to 
40. 46 and 40, only 6 millimeters difference. There, the difference was 60. But in spite of that, all the carbon dioxide that is brought and needs to be given up can be given up in the same one third of the pulmonary capillary because carbon dioxide is much more water soluble than oxygen and therefore it can be transported more easily. Uh, and uh, because of greater solubility, it can be transferred easily from the blood to the alveoli. And once again, you'll see that all of it is not being given up. It arrives with 46 and then it leaves still has 40 millimeters of mercury tension left. In terms of volumes, it arrives at 52 milliliters per 100 ml of blood, leaves at 48, which means only as in case of oxygen we saw in the cells, it, uh, only 25% is lost. Here also comes 48, leaves with, uh, comes with 52, leaves with 48. So once again, uh, about 20%. So only about 20% of uh, the carbon dioxide is given up, the less stays here. Now this again, you know, is uh, something which uh, we find strange because we have a tendency to treat carbon dioxide as a sort of a poisonous gas. It is not poison. It is a waste product. There's a difference between the two. And uh, therefore, not only it is uh, not a poison, we need a certain amount of carbon dioxide to be present and it has important functions in the body, some of which we'll see uh, today as we go along. And uh, therefore, carbon dioxide is not a poison. And uh, therefore, when we say that uh, the blood gets purified when it passes through the lungs, as if we are getting rid of a poison, that is also not true. And when we say that uh, oxygen is given up, carbon dioxide is picked up, sometimes the mental picture is uh, uh, blood arrives with no oxygen and leaves with a lot of oxygen. It arrives with a lot of carbon dioxide, leaves with no carbon dioxide. That is not true. It's only uh, differences relative. Arrives with a, quite a bit of oxygen, picks up a little more, arrives with a lot of carbon dioxide, gives up a little, and leaves with still quite a bit intact in the blood. Because all these oxygen and carbon dioxide tensions in the blood have important regulatory roles in the both cardiovascular system and respiratory system. Now, respiration is one function which is involuntary that can be controlled to some extent voluntarily. Now, why only to some extent? Suppose a person tries to uh, stop the breathing by holding the breath. Oxygen levels will start falling. Carbon dioxide levels will start rising. And the result of the two will be that the person will reach what is called a breaking point. At this point, the person will feel a very strong urge to breathe. And uh, therefore, now he cannot voluntarily hold the breath any longer. You can try it anytime, uh, pinch the nose and uh, don't open the mouth. Uh, you will be holding the breath and see how long you can do it. There will be an uncontrollable strong urge to breathe after some time. In the same way, suppose a person breathes voluntarily very hard and fast. The way it does, you know, when you test maximum voluntary ventilation or when the person is doing Kapalabhati. Try to do it for one minute. You'll find that before you reach that one minute, you'll uh, feel like stopping the breathing and a person may even faint. And that is why when we uh, test the person for maximum voluntary ventilation, we do it for only 15 to 20 seconds and get the result by multiplying. So if you've done it for 20 seconds, you multiply the ventilation by three to get how much per minute because the person cannot go on doing that for a full one minute. So we can control our... Uh, pattern and rate of breathing voluntarily, but only up to a point. And what are the regulatory mechanisms? Uh, neural mechanisms, hormonal mechanisms, and gas pressures. All are important. And uh, where are they regulated from? Uh, from uh, just about anything you can think of, which would be related, which means a large amount of information coming from many sources is integrated to uh, is integrated for the person for to be able to regulate the breathing. So information from many places is being regulated. Uh, it is uh, information coming from blood vessels. Some of the blood vessels where receptors are there. It is coming from the gas pressures. It is coming from uh, the uh, lungs. 
which has stretch receptors. It is coming from pulmonary capillaries, where there's another type of receptors which respond to pulmonary congestion. And there are receptors in the muscles which we use for breathing. Now, all these put together are uh, sending information to the regulatory centers, the uh, neural centers, and the endocrine glands. And all this is being integrated to decide what the rate and uh, pattern of breathing should be, what the rate and depth of breathing should be. But some of the major ones we'll concentrate on, and that is the gas pressures. Uh, and you can understand that uh, as the oxygen levels fall, uh, the person should be breathing uh, faster and harder for the oxygen levels to be taken up to the normal level. And if a person's carbon dioxide levels rise due to any reason, say during heavy exercise, then uh, again, the person needs to breathe harder and faster to get rid of this extra carbon dioxide that is being generated. So it is in this slide that we can see the response to exercise. And as in the case of uh, uh, the heart, here also, the effect of exercise begins before the exercise has actually begun. Because uh, while I mean the rhythm of respiration is generated uh, fairly uh, in fairly primitive parts of the brain, uh, these are further under the control of the more highly evolved parts of the brain, which are about feelings. And these parts in turn are in uh, close connection with the parts which are still more highly evolved which came later in evolution, that is the parts concerned with thinking. So it means that our thinking and our emotions can affect those parts of the brain where the rhythm of respiration is generated and that in turn can manifest in our rate and depth of breathing. So that's how the very thought of exercise starts increasing the rate of breathing. And then when the exercise actually begins, then uh, apart from the various mechanical receptors, which I was talking about in the lungs and the muscles, etc., and the joints, apart from these, the fall in the, a little bit of fall in the oxygen pressure and a little rise in the carbon dioxide tension that it further stimulates those uh, reflexes, which will increase the rate and rate of breathing and the depth of breathing. These are reflex responses, which means they are involuntary responses. We don't have to. Uh, do anything to bring them about, they happen on their own. Which means that uh, the body has mechanisms which do not uh, bother our, for which we don't have to bother our own willpower. The body on its own takes care to match the oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production with the rate and depth of breathing. And for the same reason, when the person sits down to meditate, that is the time when the person uh, needs much less oxygen because you brought down uh, all functions of the body to a lower level. And that is when the breathing automatically becomes uh, uh, slower, but not deeper. And that's why we say that during meditation, don't try to regulate the depth of breathing. It will take care of itself. You'll get as much oxygen as you need. You just slow down the breathing. And the person finds that as the person sinks into meditation, breathing continues to be slow, but it becomes more and more subtle, which means uh, in spite of being slow, the depth actually starts going down so that the person is hardly breathing after some time of meditation, which means very slow breath and taking in only a small amount of air with each breath. This is just the opposite of exercise. So the respiration is stimulated primarily by a fall in oxygen pressure or a rise in carbon dioxide pressure in the blood. Now, breath holding, I was talking about it a few minutes back also. So, if we voluntarily try to hold the breath, the duration of breath holding would depend upon which phase we stop it in and when we stop it. Suppose the person holds the breath at the end of breathing in, then this extra air that he took in while breathing in uh, will uh, make the person uh, hold the breath a little longer, will enable the person to hold the breath a little longer. If he stops breathing, uh, breathing at the end of breathing out, he'll be able to hold it for less. On the other end, suppose a person holds the breath after hyperventilation, that is after taking rapid and deep breaths for some time, then the person will be able to hold it even longer. Partly because as a result of this fast and hard breathing, he has 
not only raised the oxygen levels, but even more important, he has washed out the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide levels have come down drastically. And uh, therefore, the person uh, will now uh, uh, be affected by those reflexes which inhibit breathing. And therefore, uh, because of this, uh, the holding of the breath will be possible much longer. So the breath holding will depend upon what phase the person stops it in. But no matter at what, uh, when he stops breathing at the end of inspiration, expiration or after hyperventilation, if the person continues to hold their breath beyond a certain point, there will be an uncontrollable urge to breathe which will be reached when the falling oxygen tension and rising carbon dioxide tension reaches a certain level. So that is the breaking point. Till the When the person reaches the breaking point, the person will not be able to hold the breath anymore. And that is why it is impossible to commit suicide by holding the breath. Now let's to come to some of the yogic practices in breathing. Uh, in Brahmari, the chanting time can be used as an index of the breath holding time. And if a person does all the yogic practices regularly, we find that this chanting time goes up. And also what's more important is that uh, the chanting time is remarkably constant from breath to breath uh, in any sitting. So if you measure your chanting time, uh, say do five rounds of Brahmari and measure your chanting time each time, you'll find it is remarkably constant. But then uh, if you measure the same thing after say one a month of regular physical practices, including Brahmari, then you'll find that this has increased. It can be used as an index of breath holding time. Uh, it correlates very well with it. And uh, Still more important from the functional point of view, and this breath holding time is an index of the cardiorespiratory fitness, which means you can uh, uh, judge the fitness of the person from the breath holding time, which in turn is indicated by the Brahmari time. In contrast with this is hyperventilation, that is trying to deliberately breathe fa as fast and as hard as we can. Uh, this will uh, Get in more oxygen, no doubt, but then uh, that oxygen pressure uh, will still remain, partial pressure will still remain 100. And beyond that, in any case, it's of no use. But what will happen as a result of hyperventilation is that carbon dioxide pressures will start coming down. And uh, this carbon dioxide washout becomes a major force for. Uh, the breathing to be inhibited because carbon dioxide can be built up only if the person stops breathing. And why that is important is because the blood flow to the brain is regulated primarily by carbon dioxide levels. There's very little of any other type of regulation, neural or humoral or hormonal regulation of blood flow to the brain. And uh, this again, I think, uh, is uh, an index of the infinite wisdom packed into the body. Because uh, the brain needs a relatively constant amount of blood flow all the time. And therefore, better not to regulate it, just ensure that blood flow all the time. And to ensure it by that metabolite, which is an index of activity. So certain parts of the brain may be more active on some time and some other parts less active. So it's a type of a regional regulation within the parts which have a higher activity from time to time. So when a part is more active, it consumes more oxygen and generates more carbon dioxide. And the result is that this carbon dioxide can now increase the blood flow. It opens up the blood vessels in that part of the brain. It's acting locally. And the brain, uh, that part of the brain, which is more active, starts having a greater blood flow, which means that uh, the required amount of oxygen will be picked up. and the carbon dioxide which is being generated can be offloaded into this blood as this blood moves out. And uh, when this has an equilibrium has been reached, carbon dioxide levels have been brought down, the blood flow can again return to the same original level. So this mechanism uh, of the blood flow to the brain being regulated by carbon dioxide uh, is uh, an index of great 
uh, wisdom that is packed into the body. Uh, but uh, it can create difficulties when we hyperventilate voluntarily beyond a certain point. Because what happens is as a result of this carbon dioxide washout, the blood flow to the brain can start dropping. And then finally, it can drop to a point where uh, the person faints. Now, this fainting is also in a way a protective mechanism. Because if the person faints, he can't continue hyperventilating. And if he stops hyperventilating, carbon dioxide pr uh, pressures will again build up. And the person will once again have a good blood flow to the brain. And uh, he'll come around, even if you do nothing else. So in a way, fainting is good. But then before the fainting comes a warning, and that is in the form of dizziness. And uh, all these things, those who have done Kapalabhati would have experienced some time or the other. Um, if you continue Kapalabhati, a single round of Kapalabhati for too long, you'll experience first a dizziness. And if the person uh, out of bravado continues till further, the person may faint. And that is why it is normally advised that uh, the that uh, one round of Kapalabhati, at least in beginners, should not be more than about 20 seconds. After that, you can stop for a while and then do a second round. Again, stop for a while, do a third round, but do not do it continuously for more than 20 seconds or so. How long you can continue will depend upon many factors. One of those is age. Older people will be able to do it without feeling that dizziness for less periods than the younger people. And also those who do it regularly, who are physically very fit, will be able to do it much longer. And some people who have uh, extremely good physical fitness and have been doing all these practices for several decades may be able to continue even a single round of Kapalabhati for as long as a minute. And do it 100 times a minute. 100 strokes per minute for one minute is not impossible for an advanced practitioner. But then that is not this uh, type of bravado that a beginner should indulge in. Uh, build up slowly. Right now, you may be able to do it for 20 seconds. If you can, after a month, maybe 25 seconds. After another one month, 30 seconds. So build it up grow, gradually rather than trying to go to extremes. Otherwise, the person can faint. Uh, so respond to the dizziness. Another thing which is often told while giving the instructions for Kapalabhati is that uh, uh, at the end of Kapalabhati, there may be a stoppage of breathing, which is called uh, 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 Keval Kumbhakam. So there may be a temporary cessation of breathing, temporary stoppage of breathing at the end of Kapalabhati. Now that is again for the same reason. Uh, it allows the carbon dioxide levels to build up again. That happens even with any type of uh, hyperventilation, even if it is not Kapalabhati. At the end of the breath holding, the person may stop breathing for a while. But once again, psychological effects dominate. If a person has been holding a, uh, has hyperventilated and uh, has hyperventilated but does not know that cessation of breathing may take place, this person is unlikely to get that stoppage of breathing. If he has been told that the breathing may stop, then it is quite likely that the breathing will actually stop for some time. Otherwise, the breathing may just be depressed. It will uh, slow down and the depth will go down. The person may not actually stop breathing. So, which means that psychological effect again dominates. Uh, if the person knows that this is what may happen in Kapalabhati or as a result of hyperventilation, then the person is more likely to see the stoppage of breathing. The same thing applies also to hyperventilation. Uh, sorry, breath holding. Uh, at the end of breath holding, the person has an uncontrollable urge to breathe. Now, if this person's mouth remains closed and the nose remains pinched, but the person just tries to move the chest. The person tries to move the chest without actually breathing. The person can uh, hold the breath for a little longer. And this is because the psych of the psychological satisfaction of moving the chest. So psychological effects can come in. And that's because we saw that the uh, breathing is eventually being regulated, not only from uh, the primitive parts of the brain, but also by the parts of the brain which deal with thoughts and feelings. So just the, knowing that the breathing may stop during uh, hyperventilation or kapalabhati will give that cessation of breathing. 
and knowing that uh, I have feeling that I have breathed by moving the chest at the end of uh, breath holding enables the person to hold the breath a little longer. Now, Kapalabhati literally means a shine on the head. Does Kapalabhati actually cleanse the head? Quite unlikely what this cleansing is and uh, what is the what are the toxins being removed? Uh, because certainly we saw that carbon dioxide by itself is not a toxin. Uh, but uh, what does happen is that carbon dioxide does get washed out and that reduces the blood flow to the brain. And uh, before the person goes to a sense of dizziness, the person may feel a sense of emptiness in the head, which may feel like cleansing. So that is probably what is behind this feeling that the head gets uh, cleansed by Kapalabhati. And we saw that the uh, limits on the duration of Kapalabhati are about 20 seconds for a beginner. For one cycle of Kapalabhati, about 20 seconds is safe. Now, why is Kapalabhati contraindicated in epilepsy? Again, because uh, as a result of the carbon dioxide washout, as a result of the change in the acidity of the blood which will take place because of that carbon dioxide washout, uh, in a person who is prone to epilepsy, the neurons may start firing spontaneously when not required. So this unwanted extra activity of the neurons, uh, as a result of uh, uh, the washout of the carbon dioxide change in the environment, which also changes the acidity of blood, uh, can precipitate an epileptic attack. Uh, you'll find some of these things in uh, this book, The Human Machine, and uh, in greater detail in these two textbooks, Fundamentals of Physiology and Understanding Medical Physiology. Uh, this is the place where I stay and work, Shurabindu Ashram Delhi branch, and uh, it's now open to visitors. You are welcome. And uh, for questions and comments, please do contact us on yes at yesspirituality.com. Gratitude to the Mother and Shorabindo for making these sessions possible. And thank you all for being there. While you are thinking about what questions to ask, and Aditi looks up the chat, I thought I'll spend a little more time emphasizing uh, the type of misconceptions that are passed on parrot fashion almost from generation to generation by yoga teachers. Uh, as a result of these breathing practices, more oxygen will be delivered to the body, more oxygen uh, will reach the cells, the cells will become more healthy. Now you've seen that the cells are getting more than enough oxygen. Uh, in any case, uh, the blood is carrying 20 milliliters per 100 ml of blood to the cells, coming, leaving with 15, which means that more the cells did not need. The cells are not greedy and the cells do not have a bank. There's no oxygen bank in the body. And that is why if a person stops breathing, the person cannot live for more than three minutes because there's no oxygen bank. Unlike a food bank, we do have a food bank in the body. If a person stops eating, he can live for quite a long time. There is a rule of three. A person can live without food for three weeks. The person can live without water for three days and can live without air only for three minutes. And you can see a lot of, again, wisdom in this type of arrangement that has been built in the body. What is necessary has been built in. What would be redundant has not been. Air is all around us. And therefore, why store it in the body? And uh, therefore, we have no place where we can store it. Whereas uh, food sometimes may not be available to an animal for weeks and sometimes even months. The animals who do not get it for months have greater storage capacity also. You know, the, those who go into hibernation and so on, they have a greater storage capacity. But even human beings have enough to be able to live without food for uh, three weeks because uh, primitive man uh, sometimes probably did have to live without food for long periods of time. And uh, therefore, we have storage. Storage of both types, a savings account and uh, fixed deposits. Hmm? The glycogen in the liver is like a savings bank account. Between meals, 
uh, immediately after a meal, use more glucose and the liver picks up this glucose and stores some glycogen. Between meals, especially if the interval is a little longer, the liver converts from a glucose consuming organ into a glucose producing organ. Glycogen, which had been built up while the person was eating, is broken down, releases some glucose. So that is our savings bank account. Huh? In and out, it goes on. And then we have a fixed deposit in the adipose tissue, in the fat that we accumulate, the fat that gives us overweight. Overweight is also an adaptive mechanism, but it, this adaptation has become a handicap when we have more of feasting than fasting. So because of the change in the character of our civilization and our lifestyle, something which was meant to be an adaptive mechanism, which was meant to be our fixed deposit for lean periods, which we can, could draw upon, and people did draw upon it regularly, has become a handicap. They started creating disease. But for oxygen, we do not have a bank. So where will all that oxygen, extra oxygen be stored? With the yoga teachers talk about. And in the same way say that your toxins will be washed out. What they say is carbon dioxide is poisonous. That will go out if you breathe like this and that. Carbon dioxide is not a poison. We need a certain amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. If it drops too low, the brain will not have enough of blood flow. We will faint. So we do. carbon dioxide is a metabolic product. It's a waste product. But the uh, good Lord has built us in such a way that even this waste product is playing important roles in the body. So instead of giving roles to different substances, the same substance has been given multiple roles that you find so many places in the body. And uh, on one hand, it has to be removed up to a point because it's a waste product. But then while it happens to be in the body, it has been given important functions uh, where uh, it can, when the function is linked to the activity, because if it is being produced as a result of activity, then it should be able to regulate that activity because the more active a part is, the more of carbon dioxide will be produced. Why not give this function of regulating the blood flow uh, to this product, which is a result of this activity? So that and that is most relevant to the brain, but to some extent operates in all tissues. All tissues have this inbuilt regulation by the carbon dioxide that is produced as a result of activity. But then you'll say that then how does how do yogic practices help? Because the fact is they improve cardiorespiratory efficiency remarkably, one index of which is breath holding time or primary time. So that has improved. And no matter what type of tests have been done to measure physical fitness, one finds that uh, yogic practices have a remarkable effect on uh, physical fitness. It does improve. So how does it improve? Uh, it improves, uh, not only it improves, it improves to an extent which is commensurate with far more intense exercises of the ordinary type. Yogic exercises are not very intense. By themselves, do not consume too much oxygen. But the improvement in physical fitness is completely out of proportion to the intensity of the exercise. How does that happen? That happens because the various reflexes in the body are being exercised at very high levels because of the remarkable fluctuations in the pressures in the thorax and the abdomen, in the movements of the joints all over the body. Now, these are the places where those reflexes originate. And uh, the greater the intensity with which you excite these receptors, the greater will be the exercise which these reflexes will get. That is true of anything in the body. If you use it regularly, it will get better. If you don't use it, it will get weaker. Like say muscles. If you use it regularly, they grow thicker, fatter and stronger. If we stop using muscles, they undergo disuse atrophy. They become thin and weak. That applies also to every other activity in the body. So we have these reflexes. But if a person is sedentary all the time, taking no exercise, hardly has any need for any remarkable variation in the uh, supply of oxygen or removal of carbon dioxide, then the, all these reflexes which regulate the functions of the lungs and the heart to ensure that uh, the supply will be matched with the demand, the supply of oxygen will be and removal of carbon dioxide will be matched with the demand, these reflexes will get weaker. And the stronger, the uh, in more intense the exercise and more regular the exercise, more these reflexes will get strengthened. Now, yogic exercises are not intense. 
but the effect achieved is the same as that of intense exercises because uh, these after all where are these reflexes originating these are originating in uh, the various uh, receptors located in the chest in the heart in the lungs in the muscles and uh, by the remarkable variations that we achieve in the thoracic pressures in the abdominal pressures in these particularly in the breathing practices the pranayamas uh, we are jogging these reflexes at a level which is comparable to more intense exercises of the ordinary variety like say jogging so we jog the reflexes without actually jogging by uh, varying the pressures to the same extent or perhaps even more than would happen with very intense exercises like jogging and that is the secret behind uh, the improvement that we get not that we uh, send extra oxygen because the cells are greedy for oxygen or because we wash out carbon dioxide which is a poison now we can go to the questions um okay i have a question so it's believed that people who sing um they have a bigger lung lung capacity um is it similar effect like we do yoga breathing exercise is is, it, is that the similar effect yes it's a very good question uh because uh, uh you find that uh, the breathing stops uh, uh, momentarily even when we speak but when a person sings then not only the breathing you know, stops but it has to be very carefully regulated which means that most of the time the person is not breathing and making use of only those little gaps that you have available where the person uh, takes the breath so that the rhythm of the voice is not actually disturbed and uh, and that's how and the person uh, is able to again exercise these reflexes and uh, thereby uh, it works uh, not only to improve the uh, uh, sort of not only it helps in uh, in the uh, singing but it also helps in uh, jogging some of these reflexes and the person's uh, fitness uh, in terms of these reflexes may actually improve and on the other hand if the person improves this fitness by through regular yogic practices then the person will be able to sing better because the person's tolerance for uh, uh, the fluctuations that may take place in pressures improves you know the way i mean person will kapalabhati regularly instead of 20 seconds he can do it for one minute which means that our tolerance to uh, for these fluctuations remarkable fluctuations is also increasing without disturbing bodily functions so these practices would help the singer and on the other hand singing by using these same mechanisms in a different way would help improve the mechanisms thank you um i just want one other question um i don't know if it's a myth uh, um because this happened to one of my friends uh, father um after performing uh, i mean after doing pranayama uh, he had a, a heart attack so is is do this uh, i mean is if anybody who does it more um, with a lot of pressure can that can that be one of the reasons for heart attack very difficult to say unlikely but at the same time as i was saying that uh, uh, one has to be uh, careful and not try to overdo beyond one's capacity uh, but uh, it, it may only be an casual association uh, because uh, uh, these are extremely sort of rare cases not unknown certainly one case you know but um, the, it may be only an association and there may be no cause and effect relationship at all and if it is there it would be because of not being uh, careful to be able to identify one's limits usually we get a warning much before we reach a point where uh, the practice may turn out to be fatal mm -hmm. as i said even before the person faints the, there comes a warning in the form of dizziness any other questions there are no questions in the chat box then you may wind up the session one question just came which says uh, what does nadi shodhan do is nadi shodhan pranayam or anulom vilom alternate nostril breathing 
that uh, improves the autonomic balance. And uh, the reason it may do so is because uh, the uh, breathing in through one nostril or the other has a relationship to the uh, autonomic nervous system. Uh, breathing in through the right nostril activates the sympathetic system. Through the left nostril, it activates the parasympathetic system. So when one is doing it alternately, it uh, may help in uh, achieving some sort of a balance. Uh, the overall effect of yogic practices is uh, to uh, increase parasympathetic dominance, uh, which means to increase the dominance of that division of the nervous system, autonomic nervous system, which is active during rest and relaxation. And uh, uh, so, but when we say Nadi Shodhan, which means purification of the Nadis, uh, that is using a sort of a uh, whole philosophy which is rational and consistent in itself, but does not really match uh, the, does not have its counterparts, let me say, in the modern scientific knowledge. So, once again, you know, when uh, we say that uh, out of the sympathetic, uh, the uh, chains that we have, and they represent, they are represented by Nadis. One side is Ida and the other side is Pingla and the solar plexuses, etc., are the chakras. Now, that is bending over backwards to try and find some sort of a correlation where it is not really necessary. Uh, because uh, these Nadis, uh, which have been visualized by the yogis and the chakras, are in the subtle body. They're not in the gross body. We don't expect them to find in the at the dissection table or at the op, on the in the operation theater when you open up the body that's not where we expect to find them uh, both these fields of knowledge have their uh, own validity uh, in their way but um, we don't have to try and uh, because you know uh, of uh, the era in which we live we feel that unless it is uh, correlated in that fashion and we relate it to modern science it, we may not uh, the people may not trust it but then this knowledge, which has come from the uh, rishis by, from another route, is not looking for that sort of a certification. And we, it's not necessary. So it's no, uh, so to think in terms of purification of those nadis, which have been seen in the subtle body, uh, and then trying to relate it in some way with the autonomic nervous system, uh, would be sort of bending over backwards to just to uh, make a point, uh, which will be really difficult to support. I think with that, if there are no more questions, we can close today's session.